Hello everybody, welcome to Out of the Ordinary, where we uh, talk about health, nutrition and wellness. And today I've got somebody very, very special called the Pooh Fairy. I've known her as the Pooh Fairy, I've known her for over 30 years. She has worked uh, with myself and my family and my friends for well over 30 years. Uh, today we're going to talk about the... Um, the bowel system, which is uh, what we do with it, and it's uh, the colonic treatment. And um, I'm going to introduce you to the poo fairy. <laughs> Hi, folks. Yeah, um, I guess th the story today is about colonic irrigation, and uh, colonic irrigation is not a new idea. Um, it's actually mentioned in the Book of Essenes, and it's been around for a very, very long, long time. The problem today that we face is because we break the first rule of nature by not squatting on the ground to eliminate the waste from our bodies. So what happens is that not all of the waste goes out of our body. Some of it stays there. Now, um, and the second thing that I find most importantly is People hardly drink enough water for uh, the process of the colon to work. Now, lots of people have constipation. Lots of people have uh, uncomfortable bloating bellies and all of that kind of thing happens, Del. But <coughs> really speaking, every single human being is unique unto themselves. So when I work with a patient, I work with their uniqueness. And um, in the 36 years I've been doing this, I haven't seen the same person twice. And I mean that I haven't seen that person because if I give them a colonic irrigation, they're not quite the same person when I see them again. So I have, uh, you know, a passion for doing colonic irrigation and uh, I've loved every minute that I've done colonic irrigation. And the reason is because I know the value of what it does for the body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's just let's just start from the start. What is a colonic irrigation? Look, <coughs> um, lots of people do them different ways um, and they have what they call an open system and a closed system and people do, you know, coffee enemas and they do all sorts of herbal enemas and things like that. <coughs> For 36 years, I have cleaned the body just with water. So what that entails is I have a machine on the wall and it operates at 36.4 degrees and I allow water through one tube to go into the body and uh, another tube, uh, and both of those tubes are connected to a catheter. So as the water flows in, it flows in and picks up the waste products and then when I let the hose off, the water comes back out of the body, taking with it all the waste products. Kind of like you putting a dish under the sink and just rinsing it off, you know. That's what a colonic does. Now, <coughs> done well... They're fantastic. They are fantastic. Some people have more knowledge than others about how to do it and, and, and how to make it comfortable for you. I often uh, have patients that have been to other clinics and um, <coughs> find that my colonic is quite different. Um, and it, I guess, is about like anything. I have a friend who's a cook and she can walk into my kitchen and say that mixture is too dry or too wet. When you've been doing something a very long time, you know uh, how the people are as soon as I put my hand on their stomach. So what happens is that they lay down in, on the bed, I roll them on their side, I insert a very small catheter into their anal canal and turn them back on their back and then they're all covered with sheets, and um, then I start that process of washing them out. And as we go, it's unique. Every one is unique to me. Every single one is unique to me. So my job really is to read what comes out in the colonic and also to advise people, hey, you're not drinking enough water or whatever, whatever, whatever happens in that colonic happens in it. And people are suffering a lot because our food is not as good as it should be, because we're not drinking enough water, we're l 
many, many people are addicted uh, to the devices so they don't get the exercise that they used to. So there's lots of factors and how I do the colonic really depends on what the needs of the person is. So you, you've touched on a few points here. Um, what 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 do you see at the trend from, say, th- the last – well, we, we can go back 36 years. Let's just go back the last – Let's just say the last ten years. What what's the trend that you're actually seeing working with the same people? What what's the common problem that you're seeing constantly coming through? You did mention um, dehydration. Yeah, it's the big one. Yeah, yeah. The stress coming into this. Oh, hugely, at all? Yeah. hugely. And you see, um, human beings are like a jigsaw, and they've all got certain parts, and some parts match other people's parts, but they're uniquely themselves. So they might have stress from um, you know, not being able to pay their bills. They might have stress from overwork. They might have stress from a sick child. And it can be male or female. It doesn't matter. In my world, it's all the same thing. So, you know, I get people in here that are terribly stressed all the time and they don't... Uh, they have a mindset given to them and then they develop these kind of um, habits that aren't congruent with how human beings should be. In other words, my grandmother lived till she was 101 and my mother lived till she was 96. But my grandmother lived um, in the premise that you can do all things in moderation. But she was in bed at half past eight at night, not on a device at midnight. Because when the sun comes up, she used to get up. And if that was four o'clock in the summer and five o'clock in the winter, she got up with the sun and she did two hours' work before she ate. And then she had her day's work and when the night came, she was tired from working and working her body and doing all of the things that people did that we don't do now. She used to have a, a... a wood-fired copper and she had to pick up the sheets with the copper stick and all this. So people are going under stress and what they're doing is they're opting for comfort and their brain is wired in a way. Everybody's brain is wired to what gives us pleasure. So if we Uh, come in and we've had a really stressful day at work, we might sit down and eat a bar of chocolate just to get a bit of emotional stroking because we think that that's a comfort for us. It's a killer, but they think it's a comfort. And they think, you know, people that have these problems are because their memory tells them that that's what gave them comfort. That's what happens. And so the stress levels come from a unique place in each individual person it can be anything, Dill. Well, that was something I, um, I I read not long ago from one of my teachers, and he was saying that with um, what is when you get excited over something, it's because you're you're actually resonating with your heart, with what your true purpose is, and when you are resonating with your true purpose, you're vibrating at that correct level that we all are supposed to be vibrating at. And you'd probably find that there's less and less people that are doing that, doing things in life for the wrong reason, doing things for money, um, social media reasons, you know, to be to be something they're not. And they actually are constantly stressed out, which creates these issues that you're seeing, you know, day in, day out. Well, well <clears throat> you see, when I was a child, we didn't have to have Nike shoes. Mm-hmm. We just had to have a pair of shoes. Mm-hmm. And so they're... You know, and I I want to tell you now that um, I'm doing this podcast today but didn't know what I was doing because I don't know anything about it. I don't have any devices. I don't have a computer. I prefer to talk to people on the home phone. That's what I do. And so I'm making that human connection all the time. And, you know, at the greatest of adverse circumstances people are sending texts to each other like I don't want to be married to you anymore yeah really I mean what we've lost a lot of Del is our humanity our love for each other and and the care of human beings to care about how you are that's what happens Mm, mm, mm. 
What? What? We'll go back to because we could talk forever. I could talk and, for uh, three weeks underwater. And <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> three weeks at least. <laughs> That's just on one subject. <laughs> what are some of the main benefits in a colonic irrigation? Well, colonic irrigation does the job that we should be doing all the time for ourselves by the way we eat and the way we exercise and the way we drink water. But colonic irrigation um, actually cleans the colon out. Now, what happens um, is that when you go to a gym and you exercise, you let water out of the pores of your skin. Now, we can't see the pores of the skin there. And they're so tiny and they're so microscopic. We know salty water comes out of it because we can feel it, taste it. So what most people don't know is that the colon has exactly those same holes in it. Now, when it gets overloaded, what happens is it seeps out those walls and the first place that it goes to is the bloodstream. So instead of this beautiful crystal clear bloodstream that you're supposed to have, you've now got a little bit of toxic waste in it and a little bit more and a little bit more. Then it's carried to all of the organs of the body. So they start to underfunction. And as soon as anything underfunctions, what comes? Sickness straight mm-hmm. away. Mm-hmm. And and tiredness and all sorts of things. So colonic irrigation actually cleans out the bowel and allows the blood to be cleaned at the same time, comes back to the colon, get the next lot out, you know. Mm-hmm. And I had one lady that used to go to the toilet once a month, whether she needed to or not. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> and she came to me and she's famous with in within my clinic because um, I usually do one, two or three colonics on people, just depending on how they are. And um, she had 67 because her colon was full from her anus to her mouth, just about, and it was cement. So she couldn't actually pass her waste because it was so hard that she couldn't get it out. So we embarked on a program and now she goes to the toilet twice a day, every day, and she's as happy as Larry. People ask me, did she get sick? Was she had headaches? She had absolutely zero symptoms. Now, that's what's so amazing. She ate normally, ate all the meals and everything and just went to the toilet one day a month. The medical profession wanted to take her colon out and I said to her, over my dead body, I can fix this, but you've got to trust me. And uh, one of the reasons she trusted me, because I was in the Air Force for six years and so was her husband, so we used to tell war stories while we done the colonic. (laughs) (laughs) But I did ten colonics on her and got nothing at all out. And on the 11th one, we got uh, a a pea-sized thing out. That's how it was. And she came constantly until we got it all cleaned out. And, you know, she went through a fair bit of... um, you know, dietary change and water and she had to squat when she went to the toilet and she had to walk and exercise. It's not just when you think about colonic irrigation, it's one element to health and it's a fabulous element because, you know, if you came in from the garden and your hands were all dirty from the dirt, you wouldn't wash them in orange juice or coffee. You would wash them in water and that's what I do. I clean the body. And um, one of my philosophies is, and I, you know, I'm a bit weird, is that the colon is the mother of the body. So if the mother of the body is standing up in the house and her aprons are clean and her rubbish bins are empty, then she can look after her children, heart, liver, lungs, bloodstream. If she's laying on the floor bleeding, sick, overwhelmed with waste and everything, she cannot look after her children. And as a result, she tries to save our life by spreading out what is toxic out of her into the bloodstream so that it goes everywhere in your body and you can cope with it. Because if she kept it to herself in the colon, you'd be dead. Mm -hmm. You touched on something before about when you actually are sitting on the toilet. I've noticed that you have, we use one, we've all got one at home, the little stool. Can you explain yeah. a little bit about the stool and how important that is and why yeah. we need to have our legs raised or even squatting when we yeah. go to the bathroom? Perfectly well to tell you all about that. Look, um, pedestal toilets aren't new. In fact, um, even in Roman times they had um, 
you know, uh, flushing toilets and, and they had aqueducts and things that took away waste. Um, it's not a new thing. But the new thing is that they developed a pedestal toilet, what they call a pedestal, that we can sit on. Now, if we want to sit on that, like kings and queens on a throne, our body is in a position of an L. When our body should be in squat position. So when we sit on a toilet like a queen on a throne, we're using none of the muscles in the sigmoid or anything that empty the colon. So every time we defecate, there's something left behind. Now, the Lots and lots of people come to me and say, oh, I've got a stool and I put it in front of my feet and I lift my knees up. That is completely opposite to what you need to do. You need to stand on two stools and you can get them for about $10 each at Woolworths or something and they're like a little half thing and they have them for kids and that. And you just put the two halves around the toilet and you stand on them. Then you put both seats of your toilet up and come down into squat. Now, lots of people from other countries squat on the toilet. Do not squat on the toilet because it's vitreous, meaning that that toilet's toilet frame, the thing that they're standing on, has been baked in an oven. And I have seen the result when one of them smash. They'll cut you in half in the buttocks. So the object is to stand on the two stools, come down into squat position, leave both your seats up, don't touch the toilet by three inches. And then you're squatting, ready to... And everybody tells me, oh, when we go camping, I love it because we just squat on the ground and it works. My bowel works so good and everything. Well, mine used to do that too until I fell into the hole one day. <laughs> I fell backwards. Yeah, it's not too good. <laughs> <laughs> so is there any side effects that can happen or anything can go wrong? Look, uh, you know, people talk all the time about a perforated bowel. There's only ever been one in Australia and it was done by a doctor who wasn't doing a colonic. So I don't know of any colonic irrigations that have ever perforated the bowel because when you think about the bowel and you think about the palm of your hand, if you poked your finger in the centre of your heart, palm of your hand, that's the thickness of the bowel. So poking a hole in that would require you to have some very, very bad sickness of some kind. Um, and I'm not saying only cancers, there's all sorts of other diseases, there's all sorts of things in the colon. Um, so uh, uh, the side effect is that you feel really fantastic from getting out all of this toxicity. Now, I don't treat pregnant women mm-hmm. and I don't treat breastfeeding mothers because mm-hmm. I know that the waste product can get out the side of the wall and that's in fact what I am doing. I'm cleaning the whole of the body. So I never let those people come to see me because it, I'm responsible for that child's health. So if the mother's milk, which is made from blood, is, is uh, up with all of this toxicity, the child gets it. So I don't treat pregnant women and I don't treat uh, breastfeeding mothers ever. And I have had occasion to to treat breastfeeding mothers because they were so ill Um, and what they have to do is express their milk for a couple of days and then uh, feed the baby the milk before I start on them and then they uh, express the milk for two days after I've given them a clonic and throw it away Mm -hmm. because it's very toxic. So I don't do that and I don't put anything except water filtered four times into the colon. Um, Lots of people do herbal things. Lots of people do coffee enemas and things like that. Now, I'm not saying that they don't work. They do work. But I have a passion and a love for the colonic. And if you do a coffee enema, it's like dropping a hand grenade inside your body. Of course it works. I'm not saying it doesn't. It absorbs very quickly and it smashes into the liver like a baseball bat. And I say to my patients, seriously... If you went down to your local cafe and you ordered a cappuccino and threw down your trousers and sucked it up through your anus, do you think the cafe owner would ask you back again? And the answer is no, (laughs) they wouldn't. So the whole premise of drinking coffee is to put it through the baths of your body, your mouth, your stomach, 
small intestine, large intestine. That's the whole premise Mm -hmm. of putting things in your mouth. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. not the premise of putting them in your bowel. So coffee enemas are way off the scale for me. And I have done a coffee enema on a person who was in the last stages of their life and was terribly uncomfortable. I knew it would work and it comforted her to be able to release the waste. But it's not something that I would do in my practice, Mm. definitely not. Mm. But like all things that happen to us, you have to judge what is the best treatment at the moment in time for that person. Yeah, and her best option was to let me do that enema on her. But people that have trouble going to the toilet, there is help for them. Um, this is a product that I've. Where do I show this? There, like that. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> this is a product called um, Melrose brand vitamin C sodium ascorbate. Now, most people tell you that's only vitamin C. And it is a vitamin C, but it's sodium ascorbate. It's not calcium ascorbate. So the sodium, which is only salt, um, breaks up the feces in the colon. So depending, lots of people ring me and say, oh, I'm in so much trouble, blah, 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 blah. I say, well, before you get to see me, because I'm pretty busy, um, and by the way, I don't want any more patients. I don't take any more. Sorry. <laughs> um, um but I have an apprentice. She's only been apprentice for 12 years, so she's not quite there yet. <laughs> but she's actually better than I am already. <laughs> she's brilliant. So I'll um, give Dell the name and number of that. Or I can say it now if you like. Yeah, if you like. Um, her name's Alicia Ross, and she works out of Hydro Cleanse in Orange, and she's brilliant. And she also works out of Dubbo. She is a brilliant colonic irrigationist because she uses her heart first, yeah, in all of it, yeah. And she rings me twice a week um, just to update, to make sure she's on track with everything. She rang me this morning. And um, we keep in touch all the time. And she is, in fact, better than I am now. But, uh, you know, when you apprentice yourself to somebody, I still ring my teacher, and that's 36 years ago. I still ring her because who would know that we were going to get COVID-19? You know, who would know that? So anybody that thinks that they know everything, they're kidding themselves because there's stuff coming along all the time. And as a therapist, I need to be in that. And with this sodium ascorbate, you need to take it in a particular dose for you. So you need to, you can't just, you know, take two teaspoons every day and it work. Some people I put on quarter of a teaspoon, some people half, some people two flat teaspoons a day. But it just depends when you're talking to me and I hear you because, you see, human beings, we communicate with our voice. A lady rang me and she said to me, oh, can I get a, an appointment with you, Pooh Fairy? And I said, yeah, sure. And I said, well, look, the next one I've got is two weeks away and it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she said, oh, thank you so much. And I said to her, but actually you're sick right now, aren't you? I can hear you. That's why I don't like texts because I can't feel them. I can't hear them. And she said, yeah, I'm really sick. I said, get here now and we'll deal with it now. Two weeks away is too long. I'll Come in the middle of the night, in the middle of the morning, I don't care. Come and I'll fix it now. Because we've forgotten to hear the intonation in people's voices. That's why I use a home phone. Because I want to hear how they are and what their needs are and how sick they are and how sick they're not. And some people... uh, you know, having different treatments from different practitioners and different doctors, and that's all fantastic and very, very good. But some people get frightened by what they learn. And, you know, I have very, very seriously sick, had ha- have had very seriously sick people with all sorts of diseases and everything, but they are more agitated and fearful because most people don't know how their body works, to be honest. And we have a joke in natural therapy that says a person goes to the doctor and says, good morning, doctor, how am I? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Why today, doctor? <laughs> <laughs> so everybody is uniquely themselves and so their needs are uniquely for them. It's yeah. a bit like when I rang you about three weeks ago and I rang you up to see if you were still practising and you said, um, uh, I am, but I probably don't know if I can fit my your, your, your friend in, but I need to see you tomorrow. And I went, uh, uh, it's not why I called you. <laughs> and that was a Friday. And you go, I will see you tomorrow. I said, oh, uh, okay. <laughs> and right, I was exactly. driving all the way up here and I was going, um, <laughs> what, just, what is happening? <laughs> but you know what? It all happens for a reason because we, we, I got my uh, colonic irrigation and then as I was laying there I said, my perfect candidate. I, got, I need to get my teacher on this and, and, and spread the word as, as what we do. And um, this is how it all eventuated. It was like very spontaneous. So, yeah. So the other thing that I, was, um, I wanted to know was what sort of um, – what would someone expect – after a treatment, like what sort of benefits would they, what would they feel? Okay, so um, most of my patients feel like jumping over the moon. Feel, mm-hmm. A few of them feel like jumping under a train. <laughs> <laughs> Say, gee, that worked. <laughs> now, look, again, I can't stress ha- uh, highly enough how unique human beings are mm-hmm. and different people get different things out of colonic irrigation. What colonic irrigation does, it clears the body. It cleans it out, makes thought better, mm-hmm. makes mm-hmm. Uh, function better. Foggy head. Yeah, they get rid of that. See, a lot of people are on um, extreme amounts of um, uh, drugs and things mm-hmm. and some of them can be on, you know, uh, all sorts of different things. In fact, uh, Dell, I tried to get into the prison system oh, yeah. to help prisoners mm-hmm. um, because my feeling is that people who are incarcerated um, are definitely disadvantaged in their health because they wouldn't think that way most likely, to do crime if they were feeling better. So when you look at a person who's incarcerated, you could almost certainly say that they came from a family who uh, didn't mind a drink or a smoke or, you know, in the old days we didn't do that much drugs, although, you know, if you look at Joe Cocker. But (laughs) um, uh, these days uh, children are introduced to things very early, alcohol, cigarettes and everything, and then they start... By the time they're 12, they start to ink themselves up with tattoos or whatever they do. And their whole body is in a very bad state physically. Now, I can't do colonic irrigation in the prison system because I'm not allowed to enter the body with a catheter of of an incarcerated person. I can't do that. But a, a naturopath in America took 50 very severely um, bad... Uh, inmates and he did nothing with them except painted their cells pink which pink is a receptivity colour so they were in this receptivity and he did nothing more than feed them organic food for six months and at the end of the six months every one of those 50 men were in the library trying to learn something. Now wouldn't you think they'd carry on with an experiment like that but it never went anywhere but my theory is that colonic irrigation will clean out the body, make your mind clear, make you make better choices, um, and it's a positive step towards feeling better. And you're not so foggy in the head, or you know, sick in the belly, or bloating. I mean. You and I know that I could sit here for three weeks and talk about all of those symptoms. She's only warming up. <laughs> Yes, right, here we go. We could be up a few hours here. (laughs) Uh, But different colonic irrigationists also have different knowledge and um, uh, different levels of teaching and different things. So you can't expect to get the same colonic from another person that you get from me. You can't get it from my... um, uh, She's better than I am, though, Uh, Alicia is better than I am. But 
you can't expect to get the same treatment or the same result. If I said to you, oh, when you have a colonic, you come out and you feel wonderful. Some people feel terrible because if you think about the waste in your body, think of it as a bucket of water and the water is clear on top and at the bottom you've got a six-inch sediment. So I stick the hose in the six-inch sediment and it goes right through the bucket. So then everything is feeling pretty awful until it filters that out over the next 24 hours so some people get fantastic oh i feel like jumping over the moon some say oh i feel so crook that's because i've stirred up so much muck that indicates that they need more more colonics not less yeah Mm -hmm. but because i've been doing it for 36 years when a person is on the table with me i know where they're up to with their health and how much they'll need and everything and you see with me, um, I can read what is coming out of the body. I know which organ is under stress. And, and people get under stress for all kinds of reasons. You, know, you talk about that, but, like, I mean, I can't tell you, Del, what a person will experience after a colonic irrigation. What I can tell you is that I've already lifted waste out of their body, so something will change. Mm -hmm. Something will change for them. Mm -hmm. 99% of my patients feel fantastic and I after I've done the cleaning of it and then educated them to drink water and you know look after themselves and care for themselves and you know if uh, at midnight uh, on the device is not midnight at the oasis that's terrible they should be going to bed earlier and getting off devices i have an outstanding um case history of a patient who came into me and was so badly infiltrated with devices that she couldn't even sit on the seat without picking up the phone. And I said, I'll take that off you, thanks, because I don't allow phones in here. So I took it off her. And on the table, the worst example of mental <laughs> that I've ever seen in my lifetime. So when she finished her colonic, I said, these devices are destroying your life. Like you can't... You, you don't have any empty time in your head. Mm-hmm. You don't have that space where, you know, we contemplate things, look back and, you know, regurgitate the days. And so her um, boyfriend had bought her and I'd been tra- treating him for some number of years and he bought his new girlfriend and she was just device overloaded. I, I couldn't believe it when I saw her. And so... I took both their phones and put it in the boot and said, and because I trusted this boy because I've known him for years, I said, on the way home, I don't want you pair to speak together. No, no speaking, no talking, nothing. And so they drove home and that started her on a journey that within one month she had ditched all her devices and she cleaned out her life. She went to meditation, she went to yoga, <coughs> And within one year she was working on being a naturopath and uh, now she does all sorts of um, natural therapies with people. It could could be, um, you know, uh, massage, it could be mm-hmm. meditation, it could be... She's, she's qualified in a lot of things and she takes people on journey work and all that sort of thing. So within one month her whole life changed. In one month. That's mm. like meteoric for me. Mm. Mm. Y- you almost can't change people's direction. But the, I run this clinic with the idea that if you set out from the shore and you set your tiller, you only need to change it one quarter of one degree to not arrive at the same place. So I don't go around tearing people's kitchens up and saying you're eating the wrong food and all this sort of thing. Mind you, you know, potato chips and and, and soft drink is not food. That's not food. So it's up to you whether you want to eat food or you want to eat this sugar Mm -hmm. substitute. So the... How do you feel about EMF affecting the body, especially what you do? 
Yeah, look, um, for many generations now, we've had radio. And if I was to bring a radio in here right now and turn it on, it would be picking it up. So does that tell you that it's going through the air all the time? So we've been at, um, conditioned to listen to radio, but the sound waves or the waves have been coming through our life. Now they call it the World Wide Web. I wonder why. Mm. Because it's now encompassed the whole face or, or the whole atmosphere of the earth. So there's all of this going on all the time. Computers talking to each other and everybody's, you know, nobody shuts down and is quiet. The banks talk to each other, you know, in their computers and all this stuff. And we've become so used to um, <coughs> uh, instantaneous gratification that people don't think about the EMFs. And, of course, they're awful. Of course mm. they're awful. Mm. But I do think that we've been adapting for generations to that. But I, I don't like it. I hate it. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. hate devices. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I can't hardly use my mobile phone. The only reason I use my mobile phone is to text people to say mm -hmm. when they have to come and see me. That's mm -hmm. the only reason I use it. That's good. What about um, who can and who can't? do this treatment and is there an age limit, like maximum? Okay, limit? so look, <coughs> again, there's this unique thing. I don't do coffee enemas but I have done them. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so uh, the age for a girl is 16 and for a male 18 mm -hmm. and depending on his cultural background it could be older than that because in some cultural um, backgrounds there is a connotation around having a catheter into the anal canal is not kosher so but usually a 16 year old female and an 18 year old male I would treat those um, and it's wonderful to get people who've been sick um, I had a boy who I treated at 16 and the reason I treated him was because when he was five year old he had a rash on his face and although everybody will sit back and say, this is a lie, I don't tell lies, can't be bothered, because um, then I'd have to remember them. Um, so he came to me when he was 15, and at five years of age, he went to the doctor for a rash on his face. And they put the rash, they gave him the tablets for them, and then when he ran out of those tablets, his mother rang the doctor and said, oh, I just need some more of those tablets. And so the girl at the reception said, well, if you bring, your, uh, you know, we can have the prescription here on the desk for you. You just come and sign for it. Oh, I suppose it's a Medibank, uh, you know, visit, although there's been no visit. And that happened, Dell, for 10 years. That boy was on antibiotics for 10 years. And his mother just kept getting the refill and the doctor just kept signing the prescriptions, never saw him. Mm. Mm. It seems inconceivable and unbelievable, but it happened in Queensland and it's an absolute fact in life that that actually happened. And when I saw him, he had face like chopped liver from all the antibiotics and his bowel was so erect. Mm. It's just a joke. Mm. And so I treated him and, you know, I had to actually wean him off the antibiotics. But his mother couldn't work out why his face never healed up and why he was so angry all the time and why he was such mood swings and why he couldn't... His concentration level was about a minute at school. He couldn't do it. And all of these things, that poor little darling was just getting poisoned mm. and poisoned mm. and poisoned. Mm. And you see... He was only 15 when I treated him. But after I treated him for about a year, constantly, all of that eventually, and, you know, we got all the right things and the water and the food and the, you know, probiotics from the naturopath and we, we put him back together mm. again. Mm. And he, you know, he plays the bagpipes now. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. So, That's... but, uh, you know, and I also had a 6-year-old girl that I treated because she had a blockage in her bowel that was the size of a cricket ball mm. and so she's the only child 
that I've ever done at six years of age and she was 60 in the head because I brought her into the clinic and said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put water in there so that you can pass this. I showed her all the instruments, everything, and I had a in those years a baby catheter for a baby um, and I did the colonic on her. She went home and she passed this massive thing, was never sick again, mm-hmm. whatever it was. Mm. I've... Um my wife, uh, Jen, uh, works with uh, autistic autism ah. and so forth. Yeah. And um, the stories that she tells me, and I've done some work on that, and I be, I'm a big believer of um, that is um, due to heavy metal toxicity and that's an overload on the liver, kidneys and the pancreas, as you know. So the benefits of a colonic treatment would be very beneficial for that too, wouldn't it? Yeah, it, they're amazing. Yeah. Um, but, but you've got to be careful because I'm going to step over the line here and everyone go, oh, boo fairy. But we do find that there are a tremendous amount of uh, connections between vaccination and children. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that. I had a lady hand. in last weekend, in fact, and I was crying. Because she had a perfectly healthy one-month-old baby and they vaccinated, she went blind. Yeah, yeah. Instantly. Yeah. It just breaks my heart, you know. Mm. Just breaks my heart. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I'm seeing it now. So most of the children that the, that my wife actually works with is very heavy sedated. Yes. Very heavily uh, medications. They've just come yes. home with a whole a whole list of yeah. things that they need to take every yeah. day. There was one I remember uh, that Jen was telling me that uh, they would take one tablet would last them for two weeks. So you can imagine how toxic it was. One tablet would last them for two weeks and they'd have to take another one in every two weeks. My God. Yeah, yeah. My God. You know, in 100 years from now we'll be called barbarians because, you know, with all this chemotherapy and all of those sort of things, if we look back, we know that that's only been around for about 150 years, chemical medicine. All the rest before that was all herbal. And you see, that's in the same vibration as us. Yeah. Yeah. The um, Going back to what you said, we don't want to touch on that topic today, but for us who are aware of what's going on and so forth, um, if, we, if we go back to... Uh, well. Let's just make it, I'll try to simplify it. So when you're stressed, you create your cortisol, which makes your body acidic. And by acidic, it slows the body down because it puts you in, in um, fight or flight. And then by doing that, it actually slows your metabolism down, which slows down your body, and your organs to actually operate the way they do. So by doing a colonic will actually reverse that, wouldn't it? And actually... Yeah, but you see... People are <coughs> extraordinarily complicated. Mm-hmm. Human beings, human body, human working is extraordinarily complicated and so simple. It's a joke because when people get under stress, they make all these things happen mm-hmm. to themselves. Nobody got sick through anybody else. They got sick through themselves by their belief patterns by their and I studied religions for 10 years and the reason that I had to study religion is because people do have a belief pattern even if you're an atheist and don't have a belief pattern that's a belief pattern Mm -hmm. so I studied all of the religions of the earth and found out what they think is happening where they think And we don't want to go into religion and God and Buddha Mm -hmm. and Allah and Mm -hmm. Jesus and all of those things. But everybody has their own belief pattern. They have it about food. They have it about their mother-in-law. They have it about their father-in-law. They have certain belief patterns that trigger these things in our body. And what we need to do is ask ourselves, when I go over to see my mother-in-law, why do I have a tight feeling in my guts? Then... All of that's happening, isn't it, Dill? You know, that's how we're making ourselves sick. Like I put my hand on somebody's tummy, on their stomach, and they say, oh, that's sore. Well, I didn't put the soreness in there. My hand has touched their soreness. It's not my soreness. I didn't put it in there. 
So they have aches, pains. You know, people go to chiropractors, they hurt themselves, they have jobs at work and, you know, all sorts of things. Like three weeks underwater won't be enough to tell mm. you mm. the way that people are and they do. Um, but one thing I can tell you is that there are nobody that I know of that doesn't have the syndrome of they go to the post box, they get a telephone bill that they can't pay for and the first thing they do is go, (gasps) like that. Their child has a tooth knocked out at school. (gasps) My goodness, you know. um, Mother-in-law's sick, she could die. (gasps) So everybody has that (gasps) thing and it depends on how we let the (sighs) thing go. Because even if you and I were going to pick up this table, the first thing I'd do is go <gasps> like that and we strain that area. We ho- That's where we hold it on. There's a, uh, you know, there's a lovely photograph of a cat hanging onto a piece of rope and it says, hold on tight. <laughs> and that's what we do. Mm-hmm. We hold on tight with that part of our gut where the colon lives. Mm-hmm. And as you they know? say, the, uh, the males hold their stress in their solar plex, which is that part, and women hold it in their breasts. So what you think, what's as you know, what's going on now, so many men are getting stomach cancers, so many women are getting breast cancer. Yeah, yeah. And like those cancerous cells live in everybody, Mm -hmm. but it's whether they activate or not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I said, in 100 years from now, we'll be known as barbarians for treating people the way we have. But colonic irrigation has been around for thousands of years. And... Um, you know, it has absolutely, um, you know, been of benefit, that, uh, you know, and while some people do have some nasty side effects, it's because they're poisoned. Yeah, it's because they're poisoned. Mm-hmm. But, you know, uh, to get this in perspective, in 2019, an archaeologist found the body of a child and... Uh, It was a girl and she had gone into a cave and broken her leg and had died there in the cave and they found her body in the sediment of the cave and the cave's floor had uh, risen over time with floods and water and uh, soil and everything and they found her. They cut this block out and they took her to the archaeologist's laboratory. It took him... 25 years to get her out of that slab. And he said it was like getting a flaky pie out of out of a block of concrete. Now, they know she was 12 years old when she died because they did carbon testing. But what is important here is to remember, and I'm telling you this story, and you can go and look it up. It's called Little Feet if you've got your devices. I don't look it up on devices, but um, she's called Little Feet. And her age was 3.6 million years old. That's how old she was. And she was a homo sapien. Mm -hmm. So we have been here, Del, a very long time doing Mm. a very lot of things. Mm. And, you know, uh, uh, as I said, three weeks underwater wouldn't be enough, but we've lost 95% of our food plants on the earth. We only live on 5% of what was. You know, so we've been developing and 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 you know causing stress. My grandmother went to town in a horse and buggy, and she was born in eighteen ninety four, and there were no cars, there were no aeroplanes, there was no, and they had all of this almost shamanic healing all the time. They just healed themselves. They lived you know, 50 miles out in the bush and take you three days to get there when you walk, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And in fact, her uncle um, owned a farm and he was um, backing up his horses into a barn and somebody had left a lump of four-by-two um, timber on the floor and what had happened was that as he was backing up, the wheels of the dray went over that, which lifted him in the seat, lifted the whole dray up four inches, and he whacked the back of his head on a rafter. 
and he fell down unconscious. So they sent somebody and they didn't have horses or anything. He ran two miles to town to get the ambulance. And the ambulance was two men with a stretcher on bicycle wheels. They pushed that and ran two miles out to the farm, put him on it and ran two miles back again to the town. That's how it was. Mm. He died mm. because he had a severe head injury. Mm. Mm. But those men pushed that stretcher on two bicycle wheels. Mm. Mm. Um, as you were saying also back there about food was different to as it was you know, back yes. in the olden days, the reason why is also, um, as you know, that they don't do crop rotation anymore. What they do is they keep their paddocks and normally what they do is they rotate it. So every seven years they go back to the original paddock or they will actually plant, say, carrots on this paddock, on this one acre, and the next following year they'll leave it sit there for seven years and they'll come back and they'll rotate it. But at the moment, because it's all um, uh, the soil is so depleted, they don't use organic fertilisers, they use inorganic fertilisers, which got heavy metals in them. Apart from that is our bodies can't break those heavy metals up and they That's actually right. do... On top of that, to make the, the, the crops grow, they also um, use pesticides and herbicides. So what they're doing is now they're also doing genetically modified to, minim- to make more money and minimise the amount of herbicides and pesticides. Absolutely. So it all becomes very, very complex. And as you know, you're actually seeing the result by, you know, when yep. you're doing a colonic. Yeah, I see it. And I see that there is adaption, but I don't like the adaption either. You know, mm-hmm. but I also see that um, we've lost the humanity out of the time and the energy. Everybody's got to be have instant gratification, so they have instant scratches, they have instant phones. You know, they have texts. You can just talk to somebody there and then. Doesn't matter what you're doing, and people are picking up their phones, going like this all the time. It's absolutely there's no empty space in their time, as I said before. But all of those crops and everything. They are not only engineered, I could name the firm, but I won't, that keeps the master lot of the seeds. You have to buy your seeds from that firm and then they take a certain percentage of your harvest as payment. I mean, the farmers can't even put their own seeds in the ground. I know they're doing that with turf. With, yeah. with turf, they actually get a percentage of each whatever whatever yep. is sold. It's about That's the money. a lot, yeah. And and the company that you're talking about, I know that they they've got their hands in everything, and now they're involved in way more. Yeah. But but the good news is, is the good news is that I spoke to a friend of mine a few days ago, and she said, Annette, people that live in our world know that we've been living in the world of what we call the Capricorn Mm -hmm. influence. Mm -hmm. Now, Capricorn's about money, it's about buildings, it's about finance, it's about getting ahead, you know, it's about prestige and all of those things. And she said, we are now going into the age of Aquarius, which is about humanity, love, family, and what a way to do it. The COVID stopped the world, bang, finish. It's not the same world anymore. And imagine now... We have to stay at home and cook for our... It's no instant go out and get a takeaway, which takes longer than it does for you to cook it yourself. And so maybe she has given me the hope that we are going into the world where we are going into humanity, where we will stay at home, where children will be grateful for what they get because there'll be less to get. There'll be, you know, more conversation between human beings because it's the inf- inference in the noise that you hear in your ear that tells you how a person is you know mm-hmm. i was in the air force for six years and i got charged with not doing a job <clears throat> and when the sergeant found out i hadn't done this job we i was supposed to send somebody to the airport to pick up the four highest ranking officers in the air force and I was on weekend duty and the weekend was duty. I didn't turn the page over to Monday. And he was supposed to go at 7.30 and then he didn't go because I didn't see it and I didn't assign him the job. So they charged me with ne- neglect of duty. And my sergeant, I was charged in front of the, um, the officer, of the head of the base, 
And fortunately, I was his driver, <laughs> <laughs> which helped. But I said at the moment that that happened, I said, don't worry about that now, let's fix it. And so I was able to fix it by ringing up the Commonwealth carpool and they sent a very slick white car out to pick these blokes up and they thought that was what was going to happen. It was real. So we covered it, right? But I was charged with dereliction of duty. I went in front of the CO of the base and my sergeant said, she said, oh, don't worry about that. That's exactly what I did say. That's exactly what I did, did say. But I didn't say, oh, don't worry about that. I said, don't worry about that, let's fix it. Mm -hmm. So even in the tone of the voice, the same sentence, and the famous one is, what is this thing called love? What's this thing called love? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, we're going to almost sum this up, but there's something that I always ask everybody is, what... When you get up in the morning, what, what what makes you drive to do this every day? Okay. So um, I'm passionate about what I do. I absolutely adore the results and people who have been so sick for so long, you know, and think that there's no way out. I adore opening the door to a different life for them. And I don't have any ego about what I do. So if people say, oh, you know, the poo fairy's a wonderful healer, start running. There's no such thing as a wonderful healer. You don't go to somebody because they're a healer. Nobody heals anybody else. We stand on the sidelines and cheer like hell when you get it right. That's what I do. I don't run out in the bloody you know, tennis court and take the racket out of your hand and play your game for you. I stand on the sideline. Martina Navratilova, the best tennis player in the world, had a coach. That's what I am. I'm a coach. I say if you drink more water, if you drink, you know, if you sleep better, if you do this, if you do that, this will change things. And you only need to change a quarter of a degree not to arrive at the same place. I said that. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's this passion of making life better for people who never believed that they could have it better, that they could think more clearly, that they could eat and not be sick, that they could sleep and not be waking up. It's a passion that I can't wait to do the next one. Beautiful. So we call you the Pooh Fairy. (laughs) I thank you for your time. I thank you for all the years I've known you. I thank you for helping my friends and family and... I bless your soul and what you're doing is I hope it's never forgotten and you leave a legacy. So namaste. I'm Thank grateful you. for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, it's my great joy. Thank you. Okay, folks, <sighs> live your life the best you can. That's it. <laughs>